today I have the pleasure of interviewing Justin Shank. Justin, how are you today? I'm so good because I'm talking to you. So thank you so much for having me. How sweet are you? Like you're already just like right out of the gate. You're like, I'm just going to be the sweetest person I can be. And let's just, that's just your normal mode. So <laughs> uh, why don't you help everybody? What is it that you do right now? And who do you do it for? Wow, that's a that's a really pointed question. Uh, and so I'm I mean, more than anything, I'm a podcaster. Right. And I think everything that I do started in podcasting. Uh, so I started podcasting six and a half years ago, and it's been quite the journey and I've had massive success. Uh, and it's it's really kind of spun into what I do now. And, and realistically, I do many things, whether it be, you know, helping podcasters get their message heard. But more importantly, now I, I help entrepreneurs tell their message in such a way that it makes a big impact in the world and helps grow their business and, and everything else in between. And we do that through our community, which is the Growth Now community. And uh, I just feel really blessed to be able to, to do that every single day and, and help people get their message heard. So the way that I like to start these conversations is going way back to, I like to ask like, okay, what was life like before you were a global phenomenon, right? So I want you to take me to childhood. I want to know what it was like to grow up being you. So what are your kind of like your earliest memories of growing up being you? What was home life like for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question. I don't know if you know that it was loaded when you asked me that. Uh, but what, you know, what do you think? Do you think I do my homework or do you think I don't do my homework? That's, that's the question. That is the, I imagine somebody like you, you do your homework. Uh, which is already a step ahead of me when I when I do certain interviews. But um, yeah, so, you know, growing up was was interesting for sure. And, and it's so funny. People are like, what's your earliest memory? And some people are like, I remember laying in my crib and I barely remember high school. Right. Like it's it's just kind of how my brain works. Um, but 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 truly, I can go back to around when I was 12 uh, and I was really living that prototypical American dream life, right? My parents were still married. We lived in a very nice home in a really nice neighborhood. And, you know, I played sports and I did all those things that, that are, is pretty typical, right? As a 12 year old. Where uh, did you grow and up? I grew up in South Jersey. So really close to the beach, which is another bonus and win. Like most people were like, wow, you grew up on the beach. Like, that's so cool. Yeah, I don't like the beach. Um, <laughs> and then they're like, but you get to go to the beach all year round. And I'm like, you're not connecting one and two, it's cold there in the winter and there's nothing to do. Um, but yeah, so grew, grew up in South Jersey and was felt really blessed. Right. And so around 12, everything kind of started to, to fall apart in my life. My parents got a divorce. Uh, my mom ended up losing her job because she began a 20 year battle with opioids. Uh, and, and my dad ended up leaving his job and starting a business and was trying to get the success. And so we ended up moving from this really beautiful neighborhood and my dad moved into a trailer and my mom moved into a two bedroom apartment literally overnight, everything changed. Uh, and right around this same time, I actually broke my hip. And so I couldn't play sports anymore and completely shifted who I was. But I realized all these things ended up long term being a gift because I, I became super self aware. And I think that lends to the success I've had in business and in my podcast. Uh, and being able to have deep conversations at a young age helps me now at an, as an old man, you know, have those conversations now. Um, but but that was kind of my earliest timeline of memory uh, was everything starting to fall apart in my life, thinking that it would have been great and grand. And then it kind of started to fall apart. When kids go through something like this, just like you said, it kind of shapes you. It starts to kind of shape your view of the world. Uh, if it's okay to to stay here just for a little bit longer, you, I, we want to understand how you, you turned into you. What were your feelings? Let's separate them right now. What were your feelings about your father at the time, if that's okay to ask? Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Um, you know, my parents loved me unconditionally. Uh, even though they both had their own demons in their life, uh, they did nothing but pour love into me. And so I, I loved them back just the same. Uh, and so there was no ill will towards either of the parents. There was never any of that with, with me because they, they loved me and poured into me at the highest level. I think that's why I've been able as an adult to take crazy leaps and try big things because they're always supported me and my, and my dumb ideas. Right. And so, um, People ask me often, like going through what I went through, you know, as the as a lot of the pain points kind of went through high school, and I'm sure we'll get there. But, you know, 
they always asked like, how did you turn out the way you did? And, and honestly, more than anything, I, would th I think it was the unconditional love from my parents and learning how to unconditionally love people, even if they're not perfect. I think, I think that was kind of really the, the thing. And so I, I had no ill will towards either parent. What were your feelings about your father at the time? Hmm. What were my feelings? I, I don't even know if I can pinpoint them. I don't, I don't, there was, there was certainly no judgment. Um, I, I just, I feel like I, I loved my parents just the same, even after the divorce. And I wanted to kind of separate it because I wanted to see like, where did influences come from? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So when you're seeing two people that, you know, you've expressed, you know, you love them very much and they love you going through something so hard. I'm wondering what your role was here. And I, I don't mean the role in that, in, in blaming, because like we just pointed out, like, it's not like it was your fault and you never internalized it that way, but was your role of protector of them? Was it of listener? Was it of, you know, a kid who goes through that doesn't just watch it like it's a movie right? Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. they're in it. So what would you say was your role in this chaos? Yeah. I, I feel like my, the role that I took on was the person um, that I guess the joker, right? Like the, the one that tried to lift the energy back up in the room. Cause there were definitely moments of seeing my parents sad. And I felt like my role was to have to lift them up and to constantly be the person who was jovial and making jokes and doing all these things. So that, I think that's really the role that I ended up taking on, which was, by the way, that's a phenomenal question. Uh, that's certainly the role that I took on and I've learned, I, and I still play that role in my life in certain moments, but I also know uh, how to hold space and, and be there for people. But that was, that in itself was therapy and coaches and learning all the pain points and all that stuff in between. Okay. We just identified in order to, I want to keep using the word protect because like you're seeing two people go through something that is clearly not ideal, right? To, to, to put it very, very mildly. And you're here in this role of, okay, I need to make things better somehow, right? They're going through their thing, but I need to make this better. Let's start stepping into the years that followed. How did that feeling of, okay, I need to be helping people uplift this. How did that continue to play a role in your life? Is that something that stuck with you? Uh, I think, I don't think it was a massive role. I just think whenever, whenever I'm, I was in a situation where people felt down, I had to, I had to make a joke, right? Like, I think it was, isn't there a song where they talk about like, I'll, I'll laugh at a funeral, right? Like, I think that is, uh, that was me in, in a sense. And I felt like just naturally that became my response Um, but it wasn't, I don't, it's hard for me to identify as that because I don't feel like I was definitely that person. Uh, it's funny because, because of what I do now, which is like speaking and podcasting, people think I'm this extrovert, uh, but I'm very much an introvert. And I, I always was right. Like my friend circle was always small, even though I knew everybody, my friend circle was always small. Uh, and I didn't like being out there and being the, the center of attention and, and doing all those things. And so I never really played a role. Like I was an innocent bystander a lot of my life uh, because of being the kid with the broken hip for years. But by the way, that's the whole thing. Like I broke both my hips and had five surgeries. And so it, that lasted over, you know, two and a half years. And so, you know, I, I don't think I was necessarily ever at least I, I never viewed myself as a main character in my own life until later. Uh, until probably post high school, uh, I was more of really that innocent bystander. Like, it's really weird. I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you, um, but it's very, it's probably why I don't remember a ton of my childhood because I always felt like I was, I was the, the sidekick, the, not the lead role, all those things. Uh, and so, so yeah, like, I don't, I don't remember a ton of that stuff. Did anger have a place in all of this? No. Um, the, um, I, I never had anger or resentment towards my parents, uh, but what it caused me to be was somebody who had massive uh, uh, abandonment issues, right? Because mm -hmm. my, even though my parents were there and supportive, they chose the things they did over me. And so when I, when I look at that, it created, especially as an adult abandonment issues, like it was more of like, I had to chase people in order to feel like I had to belong in their life. 
Uh, and so this, this was unlocked like 10 years ago in therapy. So this is, this is literally like the whole, okay, what, what did the childhood traumas cause in your life as an adult? And it was abandonment. Like I was worried people would leave me and I, what I would end up doing is self-sabotage friendships and relationships and all those things. So I'm like, well, you're going to leave me anyway. So I might as well be the person who's in control of that. I want everyone to really get the context of this. You were a terrible student. You were from a broken home. Like all these things were happening to you, yet you ended up being, you know, one of the most, like, if I can say the word, like woke people that I have seen, like, like very self-aware is what I mean. And there is something that happened because um, I don't want to run out of time because we could be here for two hours. Um, there's something that happened when you were 19. Someone gave you the book, Who Moved My Cheese? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because anybody could have just gone down the wrong path having that checkered past. And it seemed like this was a really important point where you started to develop that self-awareness and that kind of realization that your life doesn't have to be what it has been. Can you tell us a little bit about that moment? I would love to know who gave you the book. Why did they give you the book? And why did you read it? Because just because somebody handed me a book doesn't mean that I'm going to go ahead and do it. What was happening in that situation? Tell us that story. Yeah, I, I will get to that. But, but one thing you mentioned, which I think is really important is self-awareness, right? Like when you're like, oh, you're woke, it means you're very, very self-aware. I had a deep conversation with a guy named Ed Milet. He came on my podcast. If you don't know Ed, look him up. He's awesome, um, has become a good friend. But we had a conversation because his dad was a, an alcoholic and my mom was an addict. And we talked about how a lot of times when you are raised in that environment, that fight or flight kind of thing where you don't know what parent you're going to get that day, uh, you become very self-aware very fast. Not only do you become self-aware, you also become aware of other people and their energy and what they're bringing to the table. Uh, and so, you know, again, what did that do for me? What did my mom's addiction do for me? It made me very self-aware and it allowed me to kind of navigate life as an adult without the guidance of what most people have. And so, yeah, so back to 19, I get handed this book. I was in a direct sales job and I thought that this direct sales job was it. It taught me everything, right? Entrepreneurship, setting your own schedule, creating your own money, all those things which were great. But the biggest thing for me was my mentor within the organization at the time uh, said, I have a book I want you to read. And as a matter of fact, my response was, I don't read books. Uh, like, no, <laughs> That's no, no, what I figure. Like just because somebody gives you a book doesn't mean you're going to go ahead and read it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a super quick read, right? Like he handed me the book. It was like super thin. If you're watching this video, like it's like real thin, it's a 90 minute read and I'm a slow reader and I can read it in 90 minutes. And so I was like, okay, fine. I'll read it. And so I started to, and I was like, I'm going to totally start this and not finish it. And once I started, I was like, oh, I see why he gave this to me. Um, and the book itself is about the realization that things are going to happen around you. Change is going to happen. That doesn't matter. What matters is how you react to that change. That's really the basis of who moved my cheese, but they use these characters and it's kind of like goofy, uh, but it's super interesting. And so uh, it led me down a path of like, wow, these books that are, these books are written for me, like for people like me versus me sitting in a science classroom and learning about chemicals and the periodic table, which I could give two shits about. I was like, whoa. And from that moment on, I became a massive student. And I started to read books and I started to read biographies and life stories and of, of these people that I was interested in. Uh, and that's what led me down the path of pretty much where I am now. That is incredible. Why do you think that it had such a big impact right then in that point in time? Yeah, it was actually the, the perfect timing because I didn't know where my future was going. And society tells me that since I grew up in a household where my parent, my one parent was an addict and my other parent has spent some time in jail, um, I'm screwed, right? Bad student, parents weren't good parents. I didn't go to college. Society said, I've got no shot. And what that book said to me was, well, no, I do have a shot. It just matters how, it, what matters is what I'm doing right now. Like what's my next thing that I'm going to do to create success in my life? Uh, so it was that timing of feeling super lost even though I found a neat little group of friends at that time and, you know, we all were all driven and all these things, I still felt like, yeah, but I can't do this forever. So, so like, what, where am I really going? Like what, you know, I don't, I don't, 
I keep hearing from society that I've got no shot. Right. And that, and that kind of goes to that limiting belief aspect that I talk about a lot of like where the limiting beliefs come from and how do you overcome them? You know, society is a big one. You know, society says you're a woman that you can't do something. Society says you're a minority. You can't do something. Society says you're gay. You can't do that. And, and the reality was I had multiple society says, uh, and so that book spoke to me at the core. Can you tell me what, if there were other books or situations that help you shape the vision, right? Because just because all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, yes, I could do something else. You and I both know that what really keeps us going and grinding every single day is knowing that we're walking towards something. So I'd love to know where that inspiration came from. How do you develop that vision of where you were going? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, so I'm a big, I'm a big reader of biographies and like learning stories. Like the most recent one I read was Cal Penn's and the one before that was Will Smith's. And I love learning people's journeys. And what this does for me is it creates inspiration. Uh, and what, and it allows me to kind of dream and go, these individuals are normal, just like me. And so as I read these biographies and I was like, whoa, like the, like some of these people have had it way worse than me. And they were able to create this massive dream. And so there's two parts to this, right? Like I was inspired to do big things. Like you always have that big vision. If I want to inspire millions of people, or I want to have a billion dollars in a company. And then what I realized is small daily action gives you opportunity to say yes or no to something. And what I was doing was small daily action, whether it be getting in the right circle or finding the next career path or finding my next mentor, which then led to opportunities of yes and no. And so the vision formed over time, uh, but it started with the, the or I should, I should say the details formed over time, uh, but it started with a, a big vision that was formed from massive inspiration. Uh, and so I think that for me, my life, everybody's like, where, where do you see yourself in five years? And honestly, I don't, I don't have this grand vision. What I see myself is, is just living in more abundance uh, and abundance to me means I can give more. And so that's all I have defined for me. Right. And so it's always like, okay, now what's the next project? What's the next thing? Like you reach out to me, like, when's your next event? And I was like, I don't know yet. Right. So like, it's very much for me, like, okay, when inspiration hits, we can then create the vision. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how you got into podcasting, um, because by then you had already tried different businesses, right? Like this wasn't, it's not like you struck gold with the first thing you tried. Yeah. So can you take us just briefly down memory lane? What were some of the other ideas that you had tried out? Yeah. So first I'll say this, as these other ideas, as I was trying to form them, I was doing very well in the corporate world, right? Like I was able mm -hmm. to overcome all the, all the things of, you must have a bachelor's degree. Like I had jobs where they're like, you need a master's degree. And I got the job. Right. And I was able to do all these things, but I was, I was miserable. Like I was doing well, but I was miserable. Like to have to go somewhere and be, I felt like I was back in school, right? Clock in, clock out. What kind uh, of jobs, so what kind of job did you do in corporate? Yeah. So it was, it started with sales and then sales management. And then, you know, the big, the big job that I had, people were like, you're crazy. If you leave was, was medical sales uh, and medical sales management. And I ran an office that did like 2.5 million a year and you know, all that stuff. And so, so yeah, but it, my whole thing was like, I was driven by freedom, right? I was driven by, I want to create this own success. Like I had a cap where, whenever I had a job, I want the cap off financially and I wanted to, to live my own life. And so I was always like, I need to do something. But I also want to inspire people in the process because I was reading these books from self-help gurus and I was like, this, I, I want to be this. And so uh, the first company that we, that me and a business partner, partner put together, we put together seminars and expos that focus on personal and professional growth. I was like 24 years old. Uh, and I was like, this is it. This is going to be the thing. And we, we had some mild success. And then we took every dime that we earned and we put it into a big business expo and we paid a guy a lot of money to come speak and all these things. But we were like, this is going to, we're going to strike gold on this one. And we ended up selling three tickets to that event. Uh, and the crazy thing is we sold three tickets, those three tickets we sold through Groupon. And if you know how Groupon worked, uh, you have to cut the price in half and then they take half of that. So we made like $70. Uh, and keep in mind the price tag to pay a speaker at this point, I think it was like $15,000. And we're like, this isn't, this isn't going to work. And so we, we ended up shutting the doors of that business. Uh, we had another one where we tried to develop an app. It's a very expensive journey. Uh, and actually another failed business business was actually the, one of the businesses that I own now, but it had failed. 
and I shut it down and then re-engaged it later, uh, which is I, I own a podcast production and coaching company which I don't promote it often. It's all through word of mouth. And I get to work with really, really cool people like Lisa Nichols from The Secret and just some really, really neat people are my clients through that. But with that being said, uh, it was a failed business that I was able to then, once I got some more footing, I was able to kind of restart it and, and kind of build that over time. Okay, the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Tell us how that idea came about. What year are we talking about? Yeah, so it was six and a half years ago. So what is that? It was... Um, I think the idea came about seven years ago. So we're in 20, so it was like 2015, like yeah. mid to, yeah, a little bit like mid 2015, the idea came about. And I was like, you know what? I suck at this entrepreneur thing. Let me inter interview entrepreneurs and learn from them directly so I can implement that into my life. Because at that time I was chasing what society told me to chase, which was the house, the car, the girl, the, all those things I said, once I get that, I'm going to be happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was chasing at the time. And what ended up happening was three months before we launched the show, uh, my mom passed away. She lost the, her 20 year battle to opioids. I'm sorry. And that com that completely changed my entire idea of life. Right. I ended up going on a three month bender where I was blackout drunk six nights a week and I was escaping the pain and escaping the pain. Uh, and that same coach who told me that it was OK to be angry called me one day and she said, what are you doing tonight? And I go, I'm going out with some buddies. And she goes, no, you're not. You're going to sit and you're going to feel this. And that evening I sat and I felt it. And it was one of the hardest nights of my life. But when I woke up the next morning, uh, this weight was lifted off my shoulder. And I said to myself in that moment, this is my rock bottom moment. I will no longer allow outside circumstances to dictate how I react to those things. And what ended up happening was on the show, I started to interview these really amazing people, but I would pick their brain about their rock bottom moment. And I would pick their brain about you know, what is self-love and how did you overcome that? Even though you look like you had no hope. And I realized that all these questions were for me because when, when I came out of that rock bottom moment, I was like, wait, I don't love myself. Hold on. I'm not happy. And I'm allowing outside circumstances to dictate who I am. So how do I make sure when I hit another moment where life gets hard, that I, my attitude doesn't change. And so the, the podcast, the idea was one thing, and what ended up happening was something completely different. And, and it took a, on a life of its own. And obviously, you know, six and a half years ago, podcasting isn't what it is now. And so I was, I was a fish in a small pond filled with smaller other fishes. And I was able to, to grow and then outgrow that pond. And as I see podcasting grow, it's such an incredible medium for people to, to really engage and learn and grow and, uh, and, and help other people in the process. It's, it's really been amazing. And if anybody goes to the beginning of the podcast, by the way, please tell us the name of your podcast. It's called the Growth Now Movement. Everybody can go subscribe to it right now. Since you're listening to this on a podcast, just go and subscribe to it right now. And everybody will notice that in the first 63 episodes or so, you actually had a co-host. Now, partnerships don't always go the way we want them. You know, sometimes they ceremoniously or unceremoniously. And um, how much are you comfortable telling us about what happened there? Yeah. So, uh, he was my business partner and all these other ideas too, uh, which is, which is really funny. And so we started the podcast together and honestly, I feel like we weren't having growth because we had kind of muddied the waters, right? I, all of a sudden I was having all these conversations about overcoming adversities and he's still talking about business and it was just going back and forth and it wasn't working. And so it didn't make sense to people listening. Mm -hmm. And he ended up going through some things in his life, which time took it was taking time away from him being able to pour into the podcast. And I just said to him, Hey, do you mind taking a step back? I'd like to see if I could do it on my own. And he goes, yeah, sure. No problem. And uh, by the way, he's one of my groomsmen in my wedding. Like <laughs> we're still really, really good friends, but, but, you know, honestly, he said just recently, he's like, honestly, if I stuck with the show with you, it wouldn't be doing what it's doing now. Like mm -hmm. it, it's just how it, how it went. And he's got no resentment. I've got no resentment. Uh, so it, it worked out a lot smoother than most business partnerships. At which point did you start thinking maybe we should do a live event? Even before the podcast. I mean, I was always driven by bringing people together. And obviously that was the business when I was 24, 25 years old was bringing people together and, and teaching and learning and growing. So I think the idea was always there. Um, you know, I was, I was about two years into the podcast when it started to be like, okay, I've got an audience here. What does that mean? How do I bring them together? How do I, you know, see who these people actually are? Because, you know, in the podcasting world, there's people that listen, you're like, who the hell are you? Like, <laughs> what is going on? And it was funny. So the last job that I had, I ended up getting fired from. 
And that's what allowed me to kind of full out, go become an entrepreneur. And it was all around the same time. And I ended up getting fired in, in May of 2018. And I announced the live event, August of 2018. And so it was always, it was always like, okay, I want to do this. I just didn't know how or what or why. And then I had this audience and I was like, okay, well, let's see, let's see what we can do with bringing people together. And so, but, I, but honestly, the, the honest answer is I think the live event always wanted to be there even before the, the podcast. For anybody who's listening, who's like, oh, maybe I should do a live event. Can you just give us like, <laughs> right? And you laugh because you're like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, what are, so, like, give me three things that people who would like to do a live event, they need to know. Like if you were gra to grab them by the shoulders and shake and like, know these things <laughs> that I had to yeah. learn the hard way. What would those three things be? Um, I would say number one, depending on how large you want your event, understand that not every single person who follows you, listens to you, does all these things, all these things is going to buy a ticket and show up. So be realistic in what it is you want to do. Number two, You want to create an, if you're going to do it, and I advise you to really think about it, but number two, you want to create an experience for people. That type of experience where not only do the individuals in the room go, okay, when's the next one? I need to be there. But the second part is like, they share it out. And then the people who see the experience they had, they go, oh, I need to be there, right? Like you need to create an experience beyond yourself uh, in these events because yeah, okay, cool. Information's great. We all want information, but you'll remember about 5% of what the speakers say. So, but what people remember is how they feel. Remember that third thing is understand that it's very, if you, if done the right way, it is very, very expensive to do an event, very expensive. Uh, like honestly, like people don't realize how much light and sound costs. People don't realize how much food costs. People don't realize any of that stuff. And so take into consideration the massive risk you're about to take and ask yourself, do I have the infrastructure in place in order to really execute this event the way that I want to execute it? Um, okay. So what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have of you as a successful business person? That I'm unreachable. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really funny. Like, because I've had the success, like people reach out to me on social media and I'll send them a voice memo back and they're like, oh, holy shit, I can't believe it. I can't believe it's actually you or, you know, people, they go, they'll send me a message like, Hey, I know this is a long shot, but would you come on my podcast? And I'm like, yeah, of course I'd be honored. Right. So I think that's a misconception people have of me. And it's funny because I used to have that misconception of the people that I'm now friends with that have been on my podcast. But once I started asking, you kind of get out of that, that discomfort. Right. So I think that's the biggest misconception. Um, and then they also, another one too, now that you've asked me this, uh, they also think that uh, like my personality on my podcast is fake. So they'll end up meeting me. Like they'll go to an event where I'm speaking at and they're like, wow, I can't believe you're like the same person in, in real life as you are on the podcast. And I was like, really? Like, that's a weird thing to think that you're listening to my show that you enjoy, but you think I'm fake. Right. But yeah. I think it's a misconception that I'm, I'm not actually that person. Yeah. And finally, if everybody who's listening had to do what you're about to tell them to do, and they have no choice, they have to do this in the next 24 hours, what would that thing be? Yeah, I would say come up with two to three things that you can do uh, right now, this day, and then every single day going forward to take care of yourself first. I think what most people miss, especially as entrepreneurs, where we feel like we have to hustle all the time, we have to feel like we have to constantly be trying to make a dollar or you know, purpose-driven podcasters like yourself and or purpose-driven entrepreneurs like yourself and, and me and everything else in between. Like we feel like we have to constantly be giving and giving and giving. The reality is you can't pour from an empty cup. So I'll come up with two to three things that you can do right now in this moment uh, and then continue to do them every single day. They could be small. They could be learn something new or go for a walk or, or uh, meditate or whatever. Come up with two or three things that you can do daily uh, to take care of yourself. And I guarantee you, you're going to see massive results outside of yourself if you do that. Love it. So Justin Shank, it's been such a pleasure. So where can everybody go and follow you, find you and get in your sphere? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I've enjoyed this thoroughly. So thank you so much. Uh, but I would say wherever they listen to this podcast, they can search Growth Now Movement. If they love it, so hit subscribe, come on the journey with me because we're all on a journey. That's all this is. Uh, and then the second thing is I love Instagram. So they can find me there at Justin T. Shank. You can see how to spell my last name in the show notes because nobody ever gets it right. Uh, but at Justin T. Shank and, and join me over there as well. 
Thank you so much, Justin. It's really been awesome. I hope, I hope this is okay. I hope it was okay to like go through all of these nooks and crannies. And you've been so gracious to share that with us. So really, thank you so much. No, this was great. Thank you for, for allowing me to, to dive into places I haven't dove into. So thank you. <laughs>